Okay. It looks like it's recording. Do y'all see that? Yep. Okay. I'll get started. Welcome from the IBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group for August 10th of 2023. This is our 86th study group. Today, we're going to be working on the techniques, prototyping and brainstorming. These are techniques that are in the BABOC, the Business Analysis Book of Knowledge by the International Institute of Business Analysis, required to be understood so that you can pass the certification classes. Screen screen is not shared. Screen. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. Let me try that again. Share. I got so excited about starting the recording, I forgot this part. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, our mission here is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the BA community. You'll notice on this map that this is not a South Florida chapter or a Florida, Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. We've got people from all over the world that view our recordings, that participate in our meetings. We welcome you all. If you are not able to view us uh, live in person and you only view us by recording, reach out to us on LinkedIn and let us know. Oh, it's nice to hear that what we do makes a difference. And so if we benefit you, regardless of how you uh, found us and use us, let us know. It's always helpful. Uh, we have a study group every Thursday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we You can reach our past media recordings, plus a lot of other information, spreadsheets, lists, all kinds of good stuff at this website. And uh, Bob, do you mind dropping these into the chat for us? Uh, we also have an IBA website, Meetup, Zoom, Facebook, and LinkedIn groups. We've given you a lot of different ways to reach us if you want to. The best way to reach us is personally through LinkedIn. We'll get to that in just a minute. Watermark Learning has been our sponsor for this study group, uh, all 86 chapter meetings. Uh, Watermark has given us permission to use their practice study questions, and they've also given us a discount code. It's Tampa Space 21. It will give you 20% off of your purchase with them. They have business analysis and other topics, uh, flashcards, practice study questions, a lot of things. Our board members are volunteers. None of us are paid. We're here for because we're serving our community. Cliff Gray is our president. Yulia, you see Yulia here. Uh, she's our vice president of finance. Caitlin and Priscilla are board members at large. My name is Thea Soren. I am the vice president of career and professional development for the Tampa Bay chapter. We're always looking for more chapter members. If you would like to be a board member, let us know. We don't ask a whole lot, but it is really good experience for you. You can either do something that you've done before, do something that you've never done before, and you can give us as much time as you want. We are also joined by Bob Churchill. You'll see Bob right here. Bob is one of our CBAPs in residence. He has a bunch of letters after his name, things he's earned quite wonderfully. He also has a wonderful website, rpchurchill.com. You're welcome to go peruse that. He has uh, blog posts and uh, webinars for a lot of things that we have done, as well as things he's done in mechanical engineering, prototyping, very interesting. I encourage you to reach out to him. Yulia, as I said, is the Vice President of Finance, but she's also a CBAP in residence. She was a student of the, of the class and she decided to come on in and help us out and help us make the chapter better. Because these people are, participating in this hour, you can use this hour as a education credit hour whenever you apply for your CBAP or any of your other certifications that require education credit. We do have quite a number of people that have received certifications after being students of ours, and we love to hear that we were beneficial to you. So if you have, let us know. We'll add your name to our list of fame. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. He's going to talk about prototyping, and then I'm going to talk about brainstorming. I'll release the um, screen now, Bob. If I can remember how to do it. Hmm. I'm not remembering how to 
stop sharing. Stop sharing. Yeah, I hit the button. We're going. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, before we start, Ashish, or um, you were thinking about doing uh, user stories. Are you ready to do that tonight? Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I remember I volunteered for it and then could not join for a few weeks. Uh, not tonight. Can I do it next week? Sure, Absolutely. that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay. In that case, I will share and we will... Talk about prototyping. Um, so hopefully you all can, there we go. Um, see my screen, I have not included a lot of pretty pictures this week, but the um, text covers everything that is in the very brief uh, um, um, Babog article on the subject. So basically, um, when you make a prototype, you're trying to figure out how some aspect of a product or a functionality or a capability or an environment will work. And you either build part of it or the whole thing. If I want to um, examine the aerodynamics of an airplane, for example, I might make a clay or metal model and put it in a wind tunnel. If I want to make a power tool, I might uh, do a mold of the outer shape of the casing to see if it is safe and comfortable to use by people with many different sizes of hands at different angles and so on. If I want to... Um, test a potential user interface, I might mock something up in Balsamic or Visio or an uh, old interface builder um, that I have associated with many programming languages. So those are all ways to do it in. Uh, you can make prototypes that are just one-offs. You can mock something up and throw it away. Or you can make something more substantial and go on and modify it over time and um, see how different things work. So there's a lot of things you can do. Um, you can do proof of concept exercises to see whether something will work, whether some software technique will work, whether a new product you're adding in will work, whether an arrangement will work or some new law of physics or engineering that's been identified, um, whether you can take advantage of that effect. A form study is basically a physical form um, that you make a physical object to test the um, ergonomics or manufacturability or finish or just how it looks. And um, um, those are um, some of the things you can do. You can also see how usable it is. So that's uh, ergonomics again comes into play with that, but you can also sure um, see if people can use all the different controls easily and without making mistakes. 
So if you're driving along in a car, you want to be able to reach all the controls comfortably and safely uh, without getting into a wreck, without throwing the wrong button, switch, dial, or knob, or so on. Or if you're using a UI, you want to uh, be able to hit enter to do a thing and not escape by accident um, to back back out, right? You can also make visual prototypes just to uh, see how things look. And um, uh, finally, a functional prototype is used to see how things work. So um, the bad bug lists a handful of methods for this. It lists storyboarding is the first one. So it actually talks about four. I had to add a fifth one because I thought the way it broke this down was kind of brain dead. Um, um, so storyboarding, you may be familiar if you're into movies and um, read about how they're made and uh, listen to a podcast by crazy people like Quentin Tarantino and uh, uh, my favorite director, William Friedkin, who just died uh, like two days ago. He made my favorite movie of all time. What they'll do is storyboard all the scenes that show the shots and camera angles and lighting they want the contents of the scene, the actions, the dialogue. So uh, you can do a similar thing if you're, say, uh, making a cup of coffee in a coffee shop. You might illustrate all the parts of the process that um, are needed to be accomplished. Now, there are a lot of ways you can do it. Some people like flowcharts, some people like written lists of instructions. Those can all be prototypes um, also, but a storyboard is a particular way to do it. Everybody has a different learning and understanding and communication style, and this is a perfectly valid tool. Um, paper prototyping is basically um, drawing stuff out on paper. You can either do it as rough sketches, just uh, get everyone conceptually on the same sheet of music, or you can make very formal um, uh, mechanical drawings, scale model drawings, or um, CAD drawings in two and 3D, right? So you can see how things fit together, how they look, and so on, and just uh, be able to talk about where everything goes and when it happens. Workflow modeling is for processes. It um, describes processes in operation. They're usually written up in the form of a flowchart. So you can see what's happening. You can see what all the steps are. That can give you insight as to the data you need, the decisions you'll make, the materials you'll require and how things will be routed at different decision points. Um, there can be branches, there can be recycles and repeated loops until we uh, get things right. There can be a scrap, there can be send it back, there can be sent to the end, we've achieved success. So all those are uh, things you can look at. The next one is simulation. This is obviously near and dear to my heart, having done simulation um, throughout most of my career. So uh, 
you can do simulation for training for design for sizing um to figure out things it would be too dangerous or expensive or time consuming to mock up in the real world and as tools get better for it um the ability to do that more quickly is constantly improving and finally the one i had to add to this um this was building physical model so um uh, because it just doesn't um uh, list that so that's most of what the book said and i wanted to uh, talk about some very specific applications of this right to give you a better picture of how um these things work so i imagine you've heard of if not done uh, most of these things so you can imagine wind tunnel testing, right? They do this for cars, they do this for aircraft. You'll often see um, car commercials, some artists, you know, lovingly detailing uh, a full-size climb model of a car to see how it looks and understand the lines and um, where everything's going to be and how it's going to look. And they may put that in a wind tunnel and they'll either table those strings to it to show where the wind's going at uh, all the different places, or they'll have a smoke wand so they'll see that the... Uh, um, air is flowing over the vehicle smoothly. And they can also test uh, when aircraft are in certain kinds of maneuvers, um, how it handles, whether the control surfaces do what um, you want them to, whether it generates enough lift um, in different flight modes, and so on. It used to be more important than it is now. Um, now they can do a lot of that with uh, um, simulations, but still um, they haven't stopped doing physical models. Um, also, they can have um, um, water-based models like submarines and ships, they can actually test in large water tanks. So um, I used to live near the Naval Research Laboratory in uh, DC, just into the Virginia side. And I had a friend who worked there. So that was interesting stuff. Now, you're fully aware of flight simulators. They can uh, test um, all or part of an aircraft. If you've ever watched stories about how the Wright brothers developed their plane, um, their first aircraft, you saw them try a whole bunch of little um sections or cross sections of wing in different shapes and configurations. And modern uh, flight simulators might uh, include uh, way more detail. So you can test uh, physical characteristics and also operational things uh, for what the pilots will do, what controls you want, and so on. And there are also full-scale functional prototypes. So if you remember the X-15 aircraft and all the crazy flying wings and other bizarre experimental aircraft. There are museums all over the country. Uh, 
that feature these odd prototypes and they were fully formed flying aircraft. Some were scrapped, some are still sitting there and you can see them. So I've talked about ergonomic studies already. Um, think of a pair of scissors or a car seat, you know, um, for different size children or for drivers that might be four foot seven all the way up to seven foot two in your Honda Accord or whatever or airplanes. Um, you wonder why airplane seats are so miserable. Not only are they stuck um, really stupidly close together, they're made to try to fit a range of people of all different sizes. And uh, a compromise is the process of making a decision where nobody is happy. So um, I talked about simulation. So um, architects, when they're designing buildings and landscapes and structures, they'll often build models. And uh, I went to college with a bunch of architects and they were always in their studio building mock-ups out of foam core models and levels that showed the terrain and little fake trees and whatever. So um, they might do those to have uh, customers be able to see and visually react to what they're planning on doing. Um, I worked at one point with building information systems. So they have these CAD and design problems that can specify every portion of a building, every I beam, every rivet, every pipe, every electrical conduit, and wall outlet, and so on. And if they um to find this stuff correctly, they can automatically generate bills on material and uh, uh, figure out what stuff has to be shipped to the building, what order to build it in, what companies and what workers you need, um skilled tradesmen or people and so on. And uh, user interfaces, we talked about that. You can mock stuff up using different products. Sometimes you'll just say, hey, how does this look? Sometimes you might build something more interactive. Microsoft is famous. Um, a lot of people do this now. But um, for doing usability testing and sitting users down at functional UIs, having them use a program and getting their commentary on what people did or did not understand. Actually, a friend of mine uh, is working with a developer to, um, put together some kind of fitness app. So I just uh, uh, experimented with it and did a live critique of a um, uh, mobile-based UI like a week and a half ago. So I'm sure you've all done that. And finally, um, if you remember the Apollo program, and if you uh, have ever seen the movie Apollo 13, one of the famous things that happened was they had a mock-up or a prototype of the command module. And the pilot or the astronaut who they thought he was too sick and couldn't go on the mission um, actually stayed in that thing for hour after hour trying to figure out a way to shut down the electrical systems and then turn them all back in 
on in order using the available power budget in a way that wouldn't break the whole thing. And obviously, uh, that effort was successful against very long odds. So it's important to remember that uh, uh, prototypes can help you test for things you know and expect, and also potentially, but not always, things you don't expect. So some lessons you have to learn the hard way. If we think about uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, you've probably seen the famous film of uh, the bridge they built it and opened it, and it was just waving in the wind. And they didn't get that, uh, the wind coming down that uh, straight between the mountains on either side over the water would roll. And uh, that um, did really crazy things to the bridge. And within a day, the whole thing ripped itself apart and fell into the water. So that was bad. And maybe if they had done some kind of simulation, which this was in the 1930s, I think maybe um, earlier or later, um, they didn't have those tools, so that's an example of learning the hard way. At the High Regency Hotel in Kansas City in 1981, there was some kind of musical performance going on in this big lobby. It might have been New Year's Eve or something. I can't remember the occasion. And there were these catwalks, these aerial walkways held together by um, long metal cables or they were solid metal bars. And sometimes um, two or three of them were held by the same set of bars. And uh, people were dancing and bebopping um, in large numbers on these uh, walkways. And uh, something the designers had never thought about was the all the bouncing up and down by all those people matched the resonant frequency of the structure and shook the whole thing apart. And the whole thing collapsed and a bunch of people died. So that was bad. And uh, one final one I'll share with you is there was a bridge over the St. Lawrence uh, River in Canada, is somewhere in Quebec, and uh, they built a railroad bridge over it. And the first train that went across, or one of the early ones, actually broke the bridge and the thing collapsed and fell in the river, and. Um, what they've done um, after that was they created the order of the engineer. And the legend has it they um, made little rings um, out of the battle from the bridge. And you're supposed to wear them on your pinky of your working hand. So when you're writing or doing a mechanical drawing or a um, calculation of some kind, the ring is always on the paper. And it is to remind you to be very diligent as to what you're doing so you don't cause anybody any harm. Now, um, business analysts aren't necessarily engineers, but we do share the same responsibility to keep people safe, to be responsible, and to do our design and analysis in the best, most complete possible way. And uh, prototypes are a great way um, to do that. Any questions?
I don't have a question, but I do have a, a story to tell about a prototype that I think was effective. Okay, uh, we were redesigning the entire process for medical diagnostic laboratories. So the, the testers would get in the test tubes, they would scan them in, then they had to key in all the information from each of the test tubes. Which tubes did they get in? What, you know, could they scan it? If they couldn't scan it, could they key it in? We were recreating the screens for them. And we had to realize that these folks had to sit in a certain position because of how close the, the, the conveyors were and where they were in the laboratory. The monitors were in a certain place. So as we were designing these touchscreen monitors, we had to literally create prototypes, which was a three ring binder that I printed all of the different screens on. And we watched how they would press the buttons, press the buttons on the paper and then whenever they would hit enter, we would flip the page and watch the next one. And we were able to create it where the things that they had to reach most frequently were closest to them. They would never have to lean forward to, to reach something. Uh, we had to you know, just kind of watch how would they literally use it before we went into development of creating the UIs. So prototyping there was a big benefit. It was a bigger benefit to me personally because I had to realize what I was doing was not just creating a screen. Oh, I know the buttons. They told me the buttons were good with the buttons. Where the where the buttons were placed, which screen they were placed on, what order they were placed on, was all dictated by what the users needed. So I, I really appreciated prototyping in that case. Does anyone else use prototyping? Okay. I mean, IDWC. Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um. Okay. Sorry. So, um, I was wondering if Bob could just do me one favor, which is like, um, we have the examples of the prototypes after the um types. Is there a way we can just match each example to the type? Like, I know that this um architects often build building models and landscape. The one after the simulations. I know it's the physical model that um, Bob talked about, but is there a way we can match each example? Sorry, that's just the way my brain works. Oh, it's, okay. no, it's a really good exercise. So that one uh, probably won't be ergonomic or whatever. It will be physical. It'll also be um, visual, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, and it could be a form study after a fashion. It could even be a usability study. If you think about the way people move around the space um, in courtyards, in and out of doors, across the landscape, how cars go in and out into the garage or parking lots, how mm -hmm. deliveries are done. Um, I know uh, I've done, worked with a lot of traffic engineers and run simulations that talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, wind tunnel testing would be physical and generally functional right yeah um so but um it could be usability when you're talking about uh the hand control spending or what you're um uh including and uh it's a kind of form study so a full-scale functional prototype and yeah. actual flying aircraft into everything Right, mm -hmm. it's all the kind um, mm -hmm. ergonomic study. Uh, somewhere in this article, I forgot to uh, comment on it. Um, like a visual study. Um, so if you can imagine mm -hmm. a potato peeler, mm -hmm. no, it's a fairly um, uh, inexpensive device. You peel potatoes, and um, so you want to make sure it's comfortable in your hand. Looks kind of good if you can figure out a way to make it happen. And um, 
some really cynical maker of those things made them with uh, handles that were colored the same color as the potato peels. And the theory was, um, if you, you know, peeled all your potatoes in, you've got all the peels sitting on your counter, and you put the peeler in the middle of that pile, you might throw them a uh, sweet ball all into the trash, and now you've got to go buy another potato <laughs> Not good for the customer, great for the people selling potato peelers, right? So if you think about it, all these things can have many of these mm. uses. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If we have no more questions or comments, we'll move on to the next topic. Right. Uh, let me just share one thing, and that sure. is, um, um, so on my website, I took a long time to um put a list together of all the links uh cliff shares with you every week and also all the uh prior recordings in the individual subjects we talked about in the recordings so um i have uh all the weeks here in all the um discussions of each knowledge area they all go to different youtube recordings um discussions of other chapters all the um business um analysis techniques all 50 these are um links to blog posts i've written this is who did the um, presentation in the first cycle. We're now in the second cycle. By the way, feel free to volunteer to um, do some of these on your own. We'd love to hear your input. And that's a link to that week's recording at the relevant time. So if you want to know about uh, financial analysis, if you uh, click on one of those links, it'll take you right to the right place. We also have uh, the guest speaker series where people talked about who um, uh, people in job functions you'll work with architects and software people and so on and other kind of managers so you can go to the links here and uh, also their linkedin uh, links are also included so make use of that uh when you can and now i will unshare Take it away. Bob, I want to commend you. That is an immense amount of effort. And we're all going to benefit from that. But thank you so much for, I can't imagine how many hours, days, and weeks that took you to get that done. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for us to have. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay. We've said that we would like for you to present topics uh, and techniques specifically, and we have that list so you can see which ones have not yet pre been presented. I'm doing it this way so today that you can see we don't need you to make screenshots. We don't need you to make PowerPoints. You can do it just this easily. I'm going to take it straight out of the BABOC. The purpose of this is so that you can see what the BABOC actually says. And so that if you have any questions, whenever you take your certification class, I'm sorry, certification test, you understand this is what the Babbox wanting you to, to respond to the questions as. So we're gonna talk about brainstorming today. Brainstorming is the fifth technique in the techniques chapter. Brainstorming is an excellent way to foster creative thinking about a problem. The aim of brainstorming is to produce numerous new ideas and derive them from themes for further analysis. Um, we want a broad and diverse set of opinions, and that's going to depend upon who you invite. So we'll talk about how to figure that out in a few minutes. 
uh, it helps answer specific questions, but not limited to what options are available to resolve the issue, what factors are constraining the group from moving ahead, uh, what can be causing the delay in whatever the activity is, or what can the group do to solve a problem. Uh, brainstorming works by focusing on a topic or problem and then coming up with as many possible solutions to it within a given time frame. The technique is best applied in a group. It draws upon the experience and creativity of all the members of the group. It, you can do brainstorming on your own, but I've found it most effective in groups. To heighten creativity, participants are encouraged to use new ways of looking at things and freely associate in any direction. The phrase freely associate is really important because sometimes you have people that they just say, well, that's not possible. And so they will never mention it. But if they mention it, it might be possible. They just don't have all of the, the understanding. They may be making assumptions. So freely associate. When facilitated properly by the business analysts, usually brainstorming can be fun, engaging, and productive. So let's talk about preparation for brainstorming. You define an area of interest. You might say, uh, let's talk about what we need for Thanksgiving. Uh, you define a time limit. We're going to talk about it for 15 minutes. You identify the participants. Who needs to be involved in this conversation? You do want some SMEs in there. You also want some people that know nothing about it, possibly. Uh, for instance, if you have some developers that you want to be in this session, get the developers that know a lot about it, and then get the developers that have only been on the team for two weeks. They'll ask the questions that nobody else asks. Sometimes you need those questions. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear my my uh, Amazon device is trying to answer the questions that I just ask. And you also establish your evaluation criteria. In that case, you're going to say uh, we together as a team will determine what the answer is going to be, or you can say it's going to have to be something that can go along with a, a requirement, which is it's achievable, it's measurable, you know the list. Then whenever you actually have the session, you share the ideas, and there's a couple of ways we're gonna talk about doing that. You record the ideas, you build on each other's ideas, and this is really where the glory of having a group together does. Because, you know, Bob can say alien, and I'm gonna say Roswell, and then somebody else is gonna say some state name, and we're gonna move on from there. But they wouldn't have gotten to the third answer if the first answer hadn't gone and we hadn't been building on each other. And you want to elicit as many ideas as possible. You want to really encourage the participants to give you ideas fast. Don't evaluate them. Don't worry about what anybody's going to think. Just give you ideas fast because it uses a different part of your brain than you do whenever you're doing logical analysis. So giving, giving you ideas fast is important. And then during the wrap up, you discuss and evaluate the ideas, you create a list, you rate ideas, and you distribute a final list. Yes. And here is the alien that Bob is showing you at this time. Okay. So the elements preparation, you want to develop a clear and concise definition of the area of interest. Uh, let people know what they're coming for, what the question is that you want to have answered. They'll have time to ponder on it. This is particularly important for introverts. Uh, people that are extroverted, like me, we think out loud. We, we talk in the moment. We don't think about it beforehand very often. Introverts don't do it that way. Introverts want to think about it for a long time. They come up with much better ideas than we do usually, and they want to ponder. They do not want to be put on the spot. So don't demand people participate. Give them a way that they can participate that's not in front of people. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the larger the group is, the more time required. I would suggest that you go for six to eight people and no more. Uh, you can do three to five if you if you feel like it's something that that group, that those particular people can work with. You do need a facilitator. And uh, you want to be sure that the people that you're inviting are specifically invited for this purpose and that these people will work well together. Uh, setting expectations with participants to get their buy-in to the process. They need to know why they're coming when you invite them, and then you need to remind them whenever they arrive. Establishing the criteria for evaluating and rating ideas. Sometimes you, as a facilitator, will be the one to do this. Sometimes you need to let the group do it. 
So let's let's stop here and talk about this real quick. Um, identifying the participants. Whenever you're identifying the participants for one of these sessions, you want to be sure that you get people that. I'm sorry, let me say it backwards. You want to be sure you don't invite people that are going to shut down the conversation. Who's going to shut down the conversation, you ask? Um, if you're in a culture that people will not talk in front of their superiors, don't invite the superiors. If you're in a culture where you've got somebody that he likes to grandstand, he wants to take over, he wants to let everybody hear himself, he's not the one you want to invite. You want to invite the people that perhaps have not had an opportunity to participate, that haven't been heard. This allows them to get an emotional investment in the outcome. It also allows them to feel heard, which is critical for a team member to feel like they have value in the oper operation. Any questions on preparation? Okay, we're gonna go to session. We want to encourage people to share the new ideas without any discussion, criticism, or evaluation, and to visibly record all ideas. So before we all went virtual, this was pretty easy because I would hand everybody a post -it, a, a pad of post-it notes and a marker and say, write anything you want on it. Just, just write it, set it on the table, write the next one, set it on the table, make yourself, you know, I don't care if you do 20. Give me all your ideas. Encourage them to give you all their ideas. Um, let them know that their ideas are valuable. And now that we are virtual, it's harder to do that. And there are some applications online that you can do that. There's some applications that uh, people do retrospectives with that are post-it notes. And you can do post-it notes that way. You can have them drop it into the chat, whichever way. But I like post-it notes, honestly, because you can organize it. Because what you're going to do is in the in the next section, you're going to organize the ideas and say, three of y'all had the same idea, which is really, really empowering to people. It's like, oh yeah, we're all thinking kind of the same. We're kind of a bonding. It's great for a, a new group to come together. Um, so, so tips and tricks on this. As a BA, Sometimes you want to know who gave you what ideas. So give everybody different color post-it notes and pay attention to who has which color. Give everybody different color markers, pay attention to who has which color. Um, you're not calling anybody out, but you're being aware. That way, if somebody is, is putting really negative things or if they're uh, brilliant, you need to know those things so you can help work with them. Any questions on the session? Okay, next one, wrap up. Once the time limit is reached, time limit that you set at the beginning, you know, 15 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, discuss and evaluate the ideas using the predetermined evaluation criteria. So they knew what the, the goal was and you need to discuss and evaluate. You group like ideas. And then once you have everything grouped and sometimes you might say, does, you know, this one, I don't understand what you wrote here. Could you help? Could somebody, if you're willing to volunteer to explain what this meant so that we all have the same understanding? You're going to get some people they don't want to talk. That's okay. If that doesn't make any sense to you, put it in a category all by itself. Uh, but group those that make sense together. You know, these four people had the same idea or there's very, very similar ideas with some small deviations. And then Whenever you get a condensed list of ideas and a, a limit and combine and eliminate as you need, give them a way to rate. If you're in person, rating with dots, give everybody, let's say you've got 10 people in the room, give everybody five dots and say you can put these dots anywhere you want as a voting mechanism. And you know, give them as many dots as you want, but give everybody the same number of dots. They can put all the dots on one if they want to. If that's what is they think is the most important or the most valuable to the team, let them do it. Then they will very judiciously walk around and evaluate each one because it's now them investing in which one the team should do. They are getting to make part of the decision. And then whenever you 
come up with this one has 20, this one has 15. So let's talk about the one that has 20 first. I suggest you talk about the top three, depending on how many votes you get, um, the top three highest voted ones, because you might find that the top one voted, most voted one isn't something you can do in the long run. So go ahead and have talked about the second and third one so that you can get an evaluation of those from the team. If someone says, but we didn't think about this thing, which is going to cause this other problem. You know, you, you need that input. You need that discussion. And while they're, they're thinking about it, it's a great time to have that discussion. Once you get the ideas rated and the team has determined what the top three are, distribute your final list of ideas to the appropriate parties. Uh, if this is a retrospective and you're doing that kind of brainstorming, you might have the appropriate parties being everybody that's involved. If this is a management wants to know what new flavor of chip you want in the break room, uh, you might just be sending that list to management. It's, it really depends upon you in that situation. Okay, usage considerations. Strengths, the ability to elicit many ideas in a short time period. This is a great way to not only get people involved and feel heard, but you get ideas from a lot of different people and they get to they build their ideas on each other. Non-judgmental environment helps enables creative thinking. Very different part of the brain again than the analysis in the brain and can be useful during workshops to reduce tension be between participants. I have used brainstorming in classes at the very beginning of a class, uh, like a six week class session to get them to start talking. You know, it's like, yes, it's okay. I don't care if you've never gone to college before, you're sitting in a college classroom and you get to talk. So it gets them in the habit of, of being a participant. Um, limitations, participant participation is dependent, dependent upon individual creativity and willingness to participate. Once again, if you facilitate it properly, you can get people to be willing to participate. Uh, it's again, important, very important that you consider if someone is an introvert, they might not wanna come and talk in front of everybody. Uh, if they have felt slammed down, if their ideas haven't been heard before, you might need to you know, just say, you know, I'm really excited you're coming to this because I haven't heard very much, many of your ideas and I know you've got good ideas. You know, give them that confidence before the meeting. Organizational and interpersonal politics may limit overall participation. That's why you're very careful about who you invite. You can't always keep the people out that, that you might want to. So you have to just very judiciously manage it. You know, it's like, hey, John, we've heard a lot of ideas from you. Thank you for that. I think that's, what's your fifth idea? You're full of ideas. I appreciate that. Let's let some of the other people have ideas. You know, let's, let's hear some of the other people's ideas. And then group participants must agree to avoid debating the ideas raised during brainstorming. We don't want to ever say, well, that was a stupid idea, or I can't believe you said that. You know, no, there's rules against that. We don't treat each other that way. Every rule, every idea that we come up with is going to be considered and we're going to honor it. It may not be the, the idea that we end up with, but we'll get to that later. Right now, we are all just producing ideas. Um, there are tasks here that talk about which tasks that you use in brainstorming. You could use it in bra brainstorming in. Um, does anyone have any questions about brainstorming so far? Um, sorry, I was just going to say that this um, page that you have, do we have access to that? <clears throat> Is it on... Are you a member of the IIBA? Yes, I am. Yes, ma'am, you do. This is on the IIBA.org website. And I literally went up to the top. Let me see if I can reach it. Let me just go back one. I went up to the top in the, uh, mm -hmm. go back one more, and put brainstorming in the search, search bar up here. Oh, okay. Wow. Nice. Good. Yeah. There's a lift. Okay. So, Maybe maybe we haven't said this in a while. If you're an IIBA member, you've got access to a whole lot. Uh, first of all, you've got access to the website. The website has not only the certification manuals, um, 
where things are, if you want to go to a meeting, what classes are virtual, uh, access to the BABOC, the Book of Knowledge, which is what we do our testing against for the business analysis certifications. But it also has a reference library. At last time I, I looked, and it, it has been a little while, there were about 500 books that you could get, uh, get access to. They are books that are not only IBA related, they're, you got the PMBOK, the Project Manager's Book of Knowledge. You've got a whole bunch of other things that are interesting. So you have access to a lot of stuff there. Also, if you're a member of the IBA and you have not joined a chapter, we would welcome you to join our chapter. Uh, as you know, these, these study groups, we don't charge any money for, unlike most of the other chapters, but you joining our chapter means we get a small amount of that chapter, the fee that you pay to the IIBA, and we're going to use that for the benefit of our organization, uh, yeah. probably for our, our members more than anything else. So okay. are you aware of all of the classes that you can and meetings that you can go to through the IIBA? No, but I'll check. Does it matter that I'm in um, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada? <clears throat> It doesn't matter where you, you can okay. attend meetings all around the world. Any chapter okay. is open to you. Uh, there are some chapters that they charge fees for trainings, but if you're an IBA member, there might not be a fee. If you're a chapter member of their chapter, there might not be a fee. So it depends on how they structure it. But oh. we're working out of the same book. So if you don't understand it from one chapter you can go listen to it from another chapter and you have access to everybody that's presenting okay wow thank you yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are quite active uh, as an organization we are worldwide we have chapters in most major cities and if you want to be involved in a, in our chapter we welcome you if you want to be involved with the chapter that you live locally to you're welcome to do that as well and still attend other chapters meetings. Okay. Um, I do encourage you to link to people on LinkedIn. LinkedIn also has a lot of IBA related activities and we try to help each other in ways both with the IBA and with LinkedIn. Okay. Okay. Yes, Bob. Um, I have attended um, meetings from chapters in seven different cities and spoken in six of them. Um, so, um, and we have participants in just these meetings all over the place in Africa, in Asia, uh, North America, obviously. Um, I think we've heard of some stuff from Europe. So mm -hmm. um, they come in from every place and we're all well, one big happy family, right? That's mm -hmm. true. It's true. Uh, if you are planning on taking one of the certifications, oh, I'm sorry, Solo, you have your hand up. I do? No, sorry. Okay, okay. well, no, it's not your hand, it's my cursor. It looks like a oh. hand. I apologize. <laughs> um, if you are planning on taking the certification test, there is a way to apply for it that it's a little complicated. And then taking it itself, it's like you really want somebody to say, well, this is what it's like. There's a recording. Yulia gave us a whole hour of this is what I had trouble with. This is what I was surprised at. This is what I didn't expect. Uh -huh. This is what I expected. It's on that list that Bob showed you earlier. I sincerely encourage you to, to look at it and see what you think. Because she studied so hard. And she <laughs> smashed it. She did awesome. <laughs> But, you know, whenever you go into a certification test, especially one that you have to pay money for, uh, you kind of want to do the best you can. And so it's kind of nice to know what you're experience, what you're expecting before you get there. OK, yeah. Just okay. one comment. Uh, IABA has speaking series on its own. They have public speaking series. You don't need to be a member. They have webinars, it's called webinars for general public. It's free, you can join. And then they have uh, webinars, speaking series for members. So you can check calendar also on the IBA website. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything okay. is there. Just okay. 
Do we have any last questions or do we have anyone who's interested in presenting a technique? We've got user stories next week by Ashish and we don't know what else we're gonna have next week yet. Okay. Again, if I have one question, but I know you, you might be able to answer me next week because I know time is running off. Just the difference between focus group and um, brainstorming. Maybe next week we can. Well, okay, I can I can take, well, Bob, go ahead and feel that. I was going to say brains, they're very similar. Focus group is meant to get a reaction to something um, that already exists or a, a prototype or a potential product. Mm -hmm. It's often geared toward the uh, um, customers and consumers, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you like this brand of laundry detergent or what have you? And brainstorming is uh, trying to come up with uh, the greatest number of possibilities, combinations, and permutations, so it's more creative, but they both kind of overlap with and bleed over into um, uh, workshops, right? And that's where you get a bunch of people together to do anything. So mm -hmm. solve a problem, analyze, do a uh, um, uh, uh, cause and effect or a uh, um, root cause analysis so they all come together there are slight differences um but uh the way you're thinking is on target to see the associations between them right thank you okay ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for your participation oh i'm sorry is mutton mapping taken already uh if you'll look on on the, I tell you what, Bob, are you checking that now? I am. Uh, my mapping is available. Okay, so if you're interested in taking mind mapping, uh, contact me through LinkedIn and you can tell me when you want to take it. And if you want to tell me if you want to take a 30 minute time slot or less. We just need to know so we know how many topics to try to put into that particular meeting. Okay, how do we join the Tampa chapter? Whenever you join the IBA, you have the option of choosing a chapter. If you haven't chosen a chapter and you've already joined the IBA, just go to your profile in the IBA and you can designate your chapter. If you have trouble, let me know. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Same bat time, same bat station. And uh, we'll get you another education credit. Talk to you then. Bye. Thank you.